favorite passage, Ephesians chapter 1. Okay, one of Joe's favorite passages. He's getting bad. He's almost got as many favorite passages as me. But uh, what's your favorite passage? It's where I was yesterday, right? God, wherever the last time God touched my heart is my favorite passage. And uh, it's kind of like my favorite song. We're going to be reading Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 14. And uh, this sermon is eight pages long. I've edited it a few times. What's the odds of us doing eight pages in a timely manner? Uh, zero. The longest sermons I ever preached usually have one page and about six words on it. And uh, <laughs> that's, that's usually, I've preached many a sermons that way. This sermon is actually pretty much handwritten. And I've gone through and rewrote and gone through and, and looked things. And you can see some scratching out and stuff. And it, it's kind of fun. And, uh, um, and, I, and I'm going to try to stick to the text today. Right and not run off on other things because you know my mind. It stays solid, right? As long as the squirrel don't run by, we are in good shape. So uh, it'll be just fine. But this, uh, uh, the name of this is the blessing of the Holy Spirit, and the uh, subtitle the order of things. And uh, so, uh, so do you always subtitle things? Well, authors do. Why can't pastors? You know, I mean, come on, you got a subtitle. Kind of gives you a little more explanation of some things that happen as we're looking at it. I want your mind thought of the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Um, preaching on Christian things. Chapter 1, verse 12, uh, the letter to the Ephesians. And, uh, I just feel like, Joe, you should read this. I don't know. I just <laughs> Joe likes this passage. Like he does. I like it too, brother. And uh, matter of fact, the first time I wrote this sermon, it was before I met you. So I liked it before you did. It might have been before you were saved. I don't know. And, uh, if you're in the book of Ephesians, then uh, I was here this morning and I pointed out that in Ephesians, I have um, all, every time it's mentioned what we have in Christ, I have it highlighted. So I can uh, just simply look very quickly at Ephesians chapter 1 and see everything that we have in Christ and what it means to be in the position of in Christ. And Paul says uh, to be found in him. And not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness, which is of, is of, of God. And, uh, and everything that a Christian has is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we sing, blessed be his name. And, that, and that's why we sing and, and do the things that we do. All hail the power of Jesus' name. And uh, why? Because without Christ, we are nothing. Without Christ, nothing else matters. Uh, if, like the Bible says, if Christ is not risen, then our faith is vain. I don't care what you believe. If Christ is not risen, it means nothing. There's no point in what we're doing here. There's no point in why we're here. Sunday night's a waste of time. Go home and do something productive if Christ be not risen. But if Christ is risen exactly as he said he would, he did what exactly he said he was going to do. In three days, I will build this temple. In three days, I will rise again. If he did that, there's a great book out there uh, um, authored by a man, uh, the leading the leading mind in, in America, at least, maybe the leading mind in the world on the resurrection, Habershaw, Hab, Habershaw is his name, and uh, Dr. Habershaw, he's a teacher at Liberty University, and just phenomenal proofs of Christ, and there's nobody on the planet today that can say Christ did not rise from the dead, it's infallibly proven, it, it cannot be denied, so what does that mean? Right? And that's what Ephesians, if you're in that, if you're in that, what Ephesians chapter 1 is telling us, what we have obtained in Christ. Now, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12 through 14, is part of that, what we've obtained in Christ, what we find in Him, and what is there. Many people do not find this stuff in Christ. They don't find the blessings of Christ. And they become a Christian, and they don't achieve what a Christian should be, and the question's why. Why? And uh, we're going to talk about a few things about the order of things. God is a God of order, not a God of chaos. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Uh, let's look at the order of a few things. Let's talk about the blessings of the Holy Spirit. Man, it says that we should be. <laughs> now, if you like circling things in your Bible, there's a contrast right there, because everything else is having, we have, we hath, everything is past tense, and then it said that we should be. Now that, that should is, uh, is a different form of the word shall, and it's a little different in the old Bible than it is in modern vernacular. 
and uh, it's not like we ought to be. Um, this is this is a guaranteed thing that we should be. It, this is absolute. We shall be would be another way of putting it. We should be to the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Ghost. Well, I'm sorry, with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. Let's, let's pray. We'll start, Lord in heaven, help us to get through eight pages quickly, I pray, but also to absorb it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read this to you. It says in, in the introduction, it says, There is order all around us, things that insist upon being placed in order so that they may achieve a given task. All right? Understand that. When not properly placed, chaos ensues. Algebraic equations demand the order of operations. If you've homeschooled and you had daughters, you know the fun <laughs> of teaching your daughters the order of operations. And uh, I have often had to repeat to my daughter, it's written right here, when helping her with math, there is an order of operations that must be followed for the correct answer. Same thing happens in life, right? If you teach somebody how to drive, it says there's an order of following and getting a driver's license, a permit, a written test, a driver's test. There is order in courtship. We meet, we date, we engage, we marry. There is order in, in oil changes. Take out the old oil before you put in the new. Yes, that's that's important, right? <laughs> what are you teaching when you teach somebody in a recipe? There's orders in your recipes. You know, you can't just follow any old order, right? Oh, I forgot to stir it. I have to do that before I bake it. Mm. So here in our Bible, we find order. The end or the results of the order is the sealing by the Holy Ghost. And you'll see that where it says... Uh, in verse number 13, it says, Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. That's the end. That's the result of the list of what he's saying here. The end is the sealing. To seal, to fasten with a seal. Boy, that's impressive. See, that's why I get paid the big bucks. <laughs> to stamp an image or a name upon using a signet. Now, Chuck has these things that, you know, you, you hold them and it has like a letter and you put it down and you can hit it with a hammer and it leaves an imprint, Right? That's the idea of a seal, right? Don't you have that for the keys, Chuck? You had a stamp for the keys, and for the keys, so you could put, you know, fellowship hall, and you could put an F on the key and hit it, and now you know which key it goes to. And uh, uh, I've seen my, uh, my kids have these little stamps, right? Then they give them to kids on a school bus, and that's a great idea. You end up putting four on your face as you're driving. A hard object and is engraven with an image and a name, and then pressed into a softer material, forming an impression. <laughs> uh, do you want your brain to be hard or soft? <laughs> Which one's the softer material? God says, I'll give you a heart. I'll take out your heart of stone, give you a heart of flesh. Why? Because it's a softer material. What's, what's, what's then what put on it? The harder material is put on the softer material. That's, that's an important statement there to try to grasp and see what's being said. Upon the soft heart of a penitent center, sinner, God seals us with the Holy Spirit, impressing the scars that were carved into the flesh of the rock of ages and his very name, the name that is above every name, stamping them forever by the power of the Holy Ghost upon the blood-washed sinner, Do you understand what that is, right? The amen say yes. Called by the mercy of the Father, redeemed by the sacrifice of the Son, and now sealed, stamped, engraved with the very name of the Son of God. Amen. This is what it's talking about. It's, about a, it's a very literal happening here, but there's also obviously some things that, that come with it. Behold, God says. Listen to this verse, Isaiah 49, 16. I have graven these upon the palms of my hands. That's what God says we are to him, this engraving idea. When Christ sees the nail-scarred hands, he sees me. That's my name. The price I paid for him. Why does he keep his scars in heaven? Why is he as a lamb slain? 
Why does he keep his scars? He clearly doesn't have to. In the resurrected body says to Thomas, behold my side. Did Thomas ever touch Jesus? Jesus said, you see me, now you believe. He didn't say touch. What did Thomas see? Revelation 3.12 uh, um, says, Him that overcometh, I will write upon him the name of my God. Hmm. The day that my heart became like wax is the day that the Rock of Ages stamped his name right there. It's right here. It's in my heart. The name of Jesus Christ is written, sealed by the Holy Ghost. But where? But there was an order to how it happened. Verse 13, it says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard. So we know that the hearing came first. In verse 13, it says, After ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom ye believed. You have this hearing, and then you have this trusting and believing, and then you have a sealing. They must hear the word of truth, says verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth. They must hear the word of truth. That is, mixed with no error. In John 14, 7, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. In 2 Timothy 2, 15, the Bible is called the Word of Truth. And in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus is called the Truth. So the Spirit of Truth wrote the Word of Truth about the truth. Amen. That's what it's saying. And then Psalm 51, 6 says this, God says, Thou desirest truth in the inner parts. What is that? Listen closely. Listen, and what is it? It's the Bible in you, it's Jesus in you, it's the Holy Spirit in you. It's in the inward parts. But it all starts with the hearing, the truth. And that is, and that truth, <laughs> that is true, um, is the gospel of your salvation. The gospel of your salvation. It's not the gospel of my salvation, it's your salvation, right? Right? I care about my salvation. I want my salvation. I can't save you and you can't save me. It's my, it's your salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's the result of hearing. And it says in verse 13, in whom you trusted. The order, right? You heard, you trusted. You heard, you trusted. Then came the sealing of the Holy Spirit. All things in order. You cannot skip the hearing. You cannot skip the believing. For Romans 14 to 6, 10, for Roman 10, 14 says, How shall they believe in whom, in him whom they have not heard? So, based upon that truth, we know our, your neighbor is never going to be saved unless they hear. I'm sorry, Calvin. And as Brother Cronister says, fake sorry. Um, no, I'm not sorry. If you don't go and tell, they will go to hell. It's, it's the way it is. It's the way God has ordained, right? Yes, absolutely. Yes, and Paul says, I am clear from the blood of all men. And he says, the blood will be on your head, and I'm a watchman, Ezekiel chapter 3 and Ezekiel chapter 30, and the watchman shall be held accountable. And God tells us, yeah, I'll, I'll count their blood at your hands. And I don't know what all that means. Obviously, you're going to be in heaven, but man, I tell you what, there's some souls that are going to be in hell because I didn't tell. I was too embarrassed to talk about Jesus. So we see order, hearing, believing, sealing. Nobody's sealed by the Holy Ghost who don't believe, and nobody believes who doesn't hear. That's the order of things, right? Now, they can hear in many ways. Of course, they can hear from a Bible track. They can hear uh, from a Bible they're reading. They can hear it on the radio. They can, they can hear it in many ways. And many people are going to be required for what they heard. They're going to say, well, I never heard it. And what's God going to say? October 15th, 1978, at 2.15, you turned the radio off because of what was being said. And they're going to go, ooh. So we see order, right? We see it. We hear the Father's call. We believe in the Son's crucifixion. We receive the Spirit's confirmation. The Father's call, the Son's crucifixion, and the Spirit's confirmation. All of these are necessary 
This is salvation. Without the Father's call, you're not saved. Without the Son's crucifixion, you're not saved. And without the confirmation of the Holy Spirit, you're not saved. Right? This is it's an order. But once that ball starts rolling, it's going to roll. Okay? It, it never changes. You cannot say, well, I'm saved without the Holy Spirit, and I can't say I'm saved with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't work that way. You're not saved because you didn't believe and didn't, didn't hear. We all have this. If there's an order to salvation. You hear, you believe or trust, and then you're sealed. That's the order. And it's the same for all of us. This isn't one of those things that can be different for everybody. <laughs> Why were things sealed? Why? What, God's using this word. He, he uses very precise. He uses sealing. He could have said anything about to, to indicate what it means to have the Holy Spirit, but he didn't. He used the word sealing. Why were things sealed? Sealing was a process of applying wax or a soft clay to a parchment or a tomb or a doorway or anything and impressing upon that soft substance the crest and the name of its owner. You got the ring on, you push it in the wax, you pull it out. That's mine. My name's on it. My crest is on it. All right? Let me give you five things that a seal represents. Number one, it was the token of authenticity. It was a token of authenticity. It is the mark and proof and the evidence of your salvation is genuine. That's what that's why God uses the term seal. Why? It's a, it's a token of authenticity. The opposite of authentic is fake, false, not original, a counterfeit. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, And ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be my witnesses. When you uh, pick up a wrench, and I wanted to bring my knife that, that Steve gave me. You pick up a wrench, you know, and from you motor heads, you know what I mean. You, you pick up this wrench. Man, that looks nice. It's got some weight to it. It looks good. You turn it over, and it says, made in China. <laughs> what do you do? You're like, <laughs> right? It's not authentic, right? It might say snap on it one side, but if it says made in China on the other, <laughs> you know, you know, it's not it. You're like, Great mechanic set. Yeah, put that thing on a, on a rusty bolt and see what happens. Uh, no, I tried to, a guy tried to convince me one time, well, that rusty bolt doesn't know whether you have a $50 wrench or a $2 wrench. Oh, yes, it does. <laughs> oh, yes, it does. Uh, the Holy Ghost, the opposite of authentic is fake. It's not original, it's counterfeit, right? You shall receive power. Is your salvation made in China? This is why companies pay for a trademark. It's their mark of authenticity. 1 John chapter 3, verse 24 says, And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. How do I know I'm saved? It's the Spirit that's in me. What is the Spirit in context? Anybody know? He'll say the word love, 32 times in 31 verses. What is the spirit that is the authenticity that I know that he dwells in us? It is the spirit's presence within and his power within that authenticates our participation in the family of God. That's what it is, right? That's what the sealing means. It's the stamp of authenticity. The spirit within strengthens us according to Ephesians 3.16. It says to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. The spirit helps us withstand sin according to Romans 8.11. So, so also shall quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. The spirit changes us according to 2 Corinthians 3.18. Changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the spirit of the Lord. This is what the spirit does. The stamp of authenticity. But many have not this mark of authenticity. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You can't be partially saved. Right. You can't have some of the Holy Spirit. You can't be a little bit on your way to heaven. It's like being kind of pregnant. Right? <laughs> Are you pregnant? Almost. <laughs> well, what kind of an answer would that be? Right? How can you be almost pregnant? Right? Well, you know, I'm on my way. Well, that's good. It doesn't work that way. They have a form of godliness, but they deny. And who's the power? What's his name? And ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost. 
Let's deny the power. And we know what that's talking about. It's the power of a holy life. It's the power to forsake sin. It's the power to walk in God's will and God's way. Denying. I can do all things through Christ. That means all things that God would have me to do. It doesn't mean I can jump off a building and fly. Right? Just like God can do anything he wills to do, but he can't do just anything. That's not what omnipotence means. It means to do what you will. The seal is the mark of authenticity. Number two, it's the form of ratification of a transaction. Ratification, the confirmation or the adoption of an act that has already been performed. That's something to get an idea of, or the idea of this transaction idea, of the ratification idea. Something's already happened, and now we ratify it. That means we, we affirm that it has taken place. It's like when we ordain Kessel, right? We are recognizing that God has already called him to preach. Does he need me to lay on my hands for him to go preach the gospel? No, God already told him to, right? <laughs> I'm just going, well, yeah, it's obvious God did this, right? We're, we're, <laughs> we're recognizing a work that's already been done. The transaction. It's an agreement between a buyer and a seller to exchange an asset for a payment. It's the idea of a, of, a, of a transaction that's already been taken care of, and that's what the seal is used for. For 10 days, 120 people waited and prayed. They were told to wait for the promise of the Father. Jeremiah 33, 14 says, Behold, oh, I love this word. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, hmm, that I will perform that good thing that I have promised. <laughs> I like that verse. Okay, you all look at me like I'm strange. That is a great verse. Behold, the day cometh, saith the Lord. You can take his word to the bank, friends. You can put your, your life on. The day comes, God says, I will perform my promise. That day comes. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. <laughs> yes, the day will come. Yes, I know the day's not here and you're longing for it, but the day will come. God will perform that good thing that he has promised. To confirm the transaction between the Father and the Son had been made. And this is one of the things to, to the, the, okay, it's not real heady, but a little heady of understanding salvation. Take yourself out of it for a minute. There's a transaction taking place between the Father and the Son. Father, forgive them. And the Father says, if they will believe. And the Son says, so be it. That's not my will, save them all. God the Father, kill them all. And the two coming to an agreement. Save them all, Father if they will believe. He is the just and the justifier of them that believe. Infinite holiness meets infinite love. Nobody can go to heaven. They're wicked. I want everybody in heaven. I love them. How does the two meet? Not my will, thy will. Father, save them if they believe. The transaction's finished. Amen. That's what the seal means. It's the ratification of a transaction that has already taken place between a father and a son to save the sinner. The transaction. We sing about it, how quickly the transaction was made in our song. The father and the son have, have, uh, had made a transaction, the ransom. And what is always the question when God says he was a ransom? Who was he ransomed to? There's only two, two answers. One's the devil or one's to, to God the Father. Who is Jesus' ransom being paid to? Who, he was the ransom for what? He, the Bible says he's a ransom. Right? Steady out. Joe will take you through that. He'll show you the word. John 14, 16. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may be, abide with you forever. Jesus says, I'm going to ask God to give it to you, and that's how you'll know your mind. You'll know the transaction's complete because I'm asking God to send you the Holy Spirit. You get this idea? He will abide with you forever. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come. Huh, has your day come? It's called the Feast of Weeks. 
I'd suggest anybody study the Feast of Weeks. We call it Pentecost. I know the Bible does. It means 50. Um, it, there's, there's 49. There's seven weeks that are supposed to come after Passover. And the, the Feast of Weeks. What was that about? What was the celebration? And in the Feast of Weeks, what does the bride receive? If that was, so anyway, you can study Ask Kessel about his book. He'll tell you all about it. How we receive the Holy Ghost upon salvation. Now, now since that day of Pentecost, uh, the moment a person is saved, they are sealed with that Holy Spirit instantaneously. The Holy Spirit of power will come into that man. Remember, it's a spiritual power. It's not a power that we think of. I'd like to read 1 Peter right now and read the entire thing that we might understand what power he's talking about when he says partakers of the divine nature and, and the, the divine power. What is divine power? Can you see it? Is it here tonight? Does it move tables and chairs and islands and mountains? What does it do? Does it make us swing and shout and jibber jabber? What's, what's the power of God do? Of course, you all know the answer because I preach it so much. It's a transformation of a free will being. Let me see you do it. We try it with our kids. How's it going? The transformation of her free will being. We can't even train Maggie, but God's able to get a hold of my soul. How is it God takes a free will being and is able to transform that free will being to a, to a free will that loves him? How can God, how did God change me? And I prayed over and over, God, whatever you did to me, do to my sons and do to my daughters. I don't know what God did to me, but man, he got a hold of my soul. He got a hold of my life. And I look at people and I think, hasn't God gotten a hold of you? And I think, man, the transforming power of God in the life of a man. I know so many of you are like, yeah, Pastor, I know it. Amen. 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 And now we receive the Holy Ghost upon salvation, the formal ratification of the transaction made in heaven. Second, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. For you're bought with a price. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. With the precious blood of Christ. Was it enough to buy me? Was it enough to buy you? We all want to say yes. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Why did Paul ask that in Acts chapter 19? What was he questioning? What did he notice? What was missing in those believers? The Holy Spirit, the very, his very presence proves the transaction is formally confirmed. I'm paid for. How do you know you're paid for? Because the blood of Jesus paid for me. How do you know it paid for you? Because I received the Holy Spirit. If you haven't received the Holy Spirit, you're not paid for. Show me the receipt. It's the Holy Spirit within me. That's how I know. It's the ratification of a trans transaction that was previously made. It's been ratified. How? By me receiving the Holy Spirit. Number three, the preservation and security. Uh, preservation and security. Books were sealed and, and placed in places of safety. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1 says, I saw, this is a book sealed with seven seals. None were worthy, it says, that to open the book except for the lion of the tribe of Judah. Uh, it was placed in a safe place in God's hand, right? To loose the seven seals thereof. The seals are those seals that, that, that guard and protect and place in a place of preservation that that can be preserved. Only one with the authority to break the seal can open the book. I am sealed with the Holy Spirit, and the only one with the authority to break the seal is the one who said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. The only, the only one with the authority, it's, it's a preservation mark. When I put my stamp and seal on that, only I have the authority to come and open it. And then I put it in a safe place, and nobody can open it until I come to open it. And he says, that seal has been placed upon you and I promise you to never break the seal. He says, I will pray the Father and he'll give you another comforter. We know that's the Holy Spirit. And he will abide with you for quite a while. Did I quote, quote it wrong? Yeah. If I ever go to hell, he has to come with me. 
and the Holy Spirit's not going to hell. <laughs> Amen. He's not, I'm sorry, but he's not going to hell, right? The seal, number four, was used to close the doors and to keep them shut. We know that. Daniel's tomb, uh, his lion's den, Daniel's tomb, as I like to call it, because now you, you can get a picture. Uh, who's the lion whose mouth was shut? Well, the, the tomb was covered, right? I and mean, we got a lion that roars now, right? Why does he just roar? Why doesn't he bite? He doesn't have any teeth, all right? Somebody punched him out in the grave. All right, Daniel's tomb is Christ's tomb, and the lions who were shut by the angel of the Lord, is Satan's mouth was shut at the death of Jesus Christ for me. Satan, Amen. shut up. He died for me. His blood covers me, right? Amen. And he knocked out your teeth. Go ahead and roar all you want, because all you can do is scare people, right? The seal was used to close doors and keep them shut. Daniel's lion then was sealed by Darius the king and by the wise men. <laughs> they sealed him in, right? We know Jesus' tomb was the was sealed with the mark and power of Rome. And that, a lot of good that did, amen? And, uh, <laughs> and now I am sealed, and the entrance to my soul is shut by the power of God. Satan has been cast down, he's been cast out, and he's not allowed to come in anymore. I am sealed, I am shut up to heaven. I am closed, case closed. Amen. Do you understand what it means to have that seal shut and sealed by the Holy Ghost? Amen. No believer can be possessed. Right. Absolutely not. Why? Because I am sealed. Okay. It said number three, then it said five. I thought I skipped one, but I didn't. Number five, and you're all happy to say finally. No, it's just, you know, it means nothing. The seal is the mark of ownership. Anything could be sealed with your crest and name showing ownership. Many of the books that Kessel lets me use, he's already signed. <laughs> and he's got this little sticker that he puts on the inside. You know, that sticker comes off. You, know, you soak that book in water. But <laughs> why does he put that sticker inside that book, right? It's that, it's that mark. It's mine. It's got the name on it, right? That's the same idea as the seal. The seal's put there and put in there. Why? It's ownership. That's mine. And anybody got a crest, know their family crest? You guys got one? The Kessels do. Kessel Huff, right? I've seen the Mills Crest, and one of my friends has it, and, it's, and they, they wrote up this book about our history, and it's got the Mills Crest on it, you know? You got one? It's like, just look it up on the internet for the crest of your last name and see if you'll find it. Mine's, of course, from England, so it's got, all, it's got an English tint to it, and some people are from Ireland, and, you know, they're kind of barbaric, and other... <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you can sometimes pick out the different lands they're from. The Swedes have a certain like flair to it, but most families will have a family crest and it'll go in there. We have a seal back in the office here when we incorporated the church, and you got this incorporate seal. And if I take that seal on any piece of paper and squeeze it, put it on there, it leaves this round mark, and it's our corporation numbers on it, and it becomes an official legal document now sealed by our church. And uh, um, that's something that, that it's the idea of ownership. Um, the seal. We were servants of sin, but now are servants of God. And that seal is showing ownership. He has sealed me. He has marked me um, as his property, right? And some crazy Christian made a song. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for the next two weeks. No, I'm, but... <laughs> Right, but for eternity, why? Because he understands. I'm sealed by God. He has placed his ownership in me. The Holy Spirit is my seal of ownership. It's no wonder Paul asked the men in Ephesus, "Have you received the Holy Spirit?" Why? It's important. Verse fourteen in our text. Yes, we are going to look at the Bible. The Holy Ghost is the earnest. That means the down payment. It means the forepayment. It means the 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 uh, where we can expect the rest because of what we've got already of our inheritance. It's the earnest, and that word earnest we don't use it much more. But the idea, and you can look in your study Bibles, it means deposit or down payment. The presence of the Spirit of God is God's pledge that our salvation will be consummated and is genuine. That's that. Yes, it's going to happen. If you have not the Holy Spirit, then you are not saved. If you have the Holy Spirit, you may wonder whether or not you have the Holy Spirit. And God says, that's a good thing. He says, examine yourself. Know you not yourself, whether Christ dwelleth in you? 
Take a look on the inside and see. If you can't find Jesus, well, how do I know? Try to be a Christian. Promise yourself to God, by God, by your grace and by your power, I'm never going to miss church again for the next 52 weeks. And see if you can do it. So God, by your grace and by your power, I'm going to read my Bible this year. I'm starting today. And I'm going to read the entire, and see if you can do it. By God's grace, because of God, I'm going to hand out a Bible track once a week this year. And by your grace and your power, I'm going to do it, God, I promise you. And now do it. Try to be a Christian. Most of us don't want to put any effort, don't want to try. What happens? You'll never know for sure. You'll be wondering and doubting at your grave if it's true, if it's real, if Christ dwelleth within. Am I really saved? Is there really a heaven? Is there really a God? Is it really going to happen? And you're going to freak out when the doctor says, I'm sorry, go home and make your house ready because there's no cure for this one. And you're going to freak out. You're going to be crazy about it. You're going to live in fear. You're going to have seven seatbelts and nine masks on. And you're going to wonder, where is God? But when you've gone out and proven, Christ dwelleth in me. Christ dwelleth in me. What is the power of God? <laughs> to transform a free will creature. Go try it. Go find a free will creature and transform them by the power of God. That is the power of God. That's it. You were a free will creature once. Are you still? Then why are you here? What has God done to you? It's an amazing thing what God can do with a free will creature. It means down payment of our inheritance. What kind of down payment? Full, paid in full. <laughs> Look at verse 14. It says, and which is the earnest down payment or deposit of our inheritance until the redemption? You know what it means to redeem something, right? You go in, you got a coupon, you redeem it, right? You go in, it means that you you take the action of going and getting it, right? Until the redemption of the purchased. Take that word purchased and put a square around it and then stamp it on your forehead. I am purchased. It's past tense. Paid in full. The, the possession. He hasn't down, put a down payment on you. He purchased you in full. He's just given you a deposit so you feel secure. You're paid in full. I am a purchased possession. And that's God's possession that he paid for. That's why I say when Jesus looks at his hole in his hand, he says, Dan Mills. Because that's what he did to pay for me. I am a purchased possession. It's paid in full. The down payment is not the idea of partial now and he's going to pay for the rest later. He paid for it all, but he's given us a little bit that we might know. That we are paid in full. If this is what the Spirit is, and there's times when I have been filled with the Spirit and such joy overflows my heart, I can't imagine what heaven's going to be when the full possession is taken. Jesus will never suffer again. There's no more payment necessary. Hebrews 9.28 says, Christ also once suffered uh, to bear the sins of many, and to them that look for him, he shall appear a second time without sin unto salvation. No payment next time he comes. Kessel likes to sing about that. The next time he comes, he won't have to die for me. The next time he comes, there won't be a Calvary. The next time he comes, we'll begin eternity, right? The next time he comes again, he'll be coming for me. He's coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Boy, the world's going to be surprised when they see Jesus. Yeah. He's not going to come back with open arms. He's not going to be a soft, hard hippie with blue eyes going, oh, I love everybody. That's, that's not, he wasn't him the first time, but that's, that's certainly not going to be him the second time. He's coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? right? Uh, he, he came to land. They, they, he's not coming to, to give his life this time. He's coming to take his kingdom. Right. And uh, Jesus Christ is coming, but prior to that, he's coming to take me. Amen. There's no payment next time, just a retrieval. Just a retrieval of his purchased possession. I'm bought with a price. Yep. How do I know I'm saved? The Holy Spirit dwells within my heart. That's right. I love the things of God. That's right. If you examine me closely, you'll find some sin. 
if I'm going by at 55 miles an hour. Because <laughs> if I'm going any slower, you're going to see a lot of sin. I don't do everything I should. I don't go everywhere I should. I, I don't act everything I should. I, don't, I, I know I fall short of all I could be for God. I know I do. And the Holy Spirit within walks me, talks to me, convicts me, and shows me. But the Bible says that we know by the Spirit He's given us. And He says the Spirit that He gave us is a Spirit of love. And it's a love for the kingdom. It's a detachment from the things of this world. And a love for the things of the next world. I love this book. Absolutely love it. I remember telling my friend that the greatest dream I had was someday to get paid to read this book. Could you imagine that being your job? Was to read and study the Bible? Is there a better job, Kessel? Could there possibly be a better job? Is it better than driving a school bus? Is it better than having your hands inside the guts of some person? And I know I can't spend my whole life with my nose in the book. Or i got to get out and do something you know, for the kingdom of heaven. But uh, I love leading people to Christ. I love watching somebody pray for the first time. You know, you started talking to them. They're like, yeah, I pray. Then you said, okay, go ahead. And they're like, <coughs> you're like, you know, pray, do you? You don't know how to pray. And you start talking to them about God and start talking about Christ. And pretty soon there's tears in their eyes and they're calling out to God for the first time in their life in faith in Christ. Oh my goodness. And they're saying, God, forgive me. Today I accept Christ as my Savior. And you know it's the first time they've ever called upon God in truth. You know, God's everywhere. He hears everything. He's heard their other prayers. But he's led them to this place that they might call upon him in truth. And it's the first time the communication between this soul and their Heavenly Father is taking place in earnest. And you get to watch it. Oh, oh there's nothing like that. There's, there's nothing like that in the earth. I, I wouldn't trade that for, well, Corvette. Okay, no, I wouldn't trade that for a vet or for a Lamborghini. No way. I wouldn't trade that for anything in the world. Anything. I love, yesterday we had a friend come over, Dylan, and we just spent the day talking about Scripture. Every time we're talking, we're bringing up Scripture. We go to Mama Jane's, we're talking about Scripture. We get up from the restaurant, and, and Dylan had tickled me and surprised me by it, so I jumped and our heads hit, right? And then I started laughing, he started laughing, but now we're being obnoxiously loud in the restaurant. So uh, I turned to the ladies beside us and I said, I'm sorry. And she said, oh no, it's fine, we're Christians, we loved your conversation. And she thought I was apologizing for talking about Christ. I was I was apologizing for being obnoxiously loud, but uh, I guess it was okay. And as we were leaving, there was, there was a guy giving me laser beam evil eyes. So I looked at him, I went, hi. <laughs> and he went, <laughs> I don't know if that was approval or not. <laughs> but uh, what a great time. I love talking about the things of God. I love discussing the truth of this book. You know, And I love a young man like Dylan, who's first time through his Bible. What's he on now? He's in Corinthians? He got through that, didn't he? I think he's in 1st or 2nd Thessalonians. He's in Thessalonians. Yeah, that's right. He just finished the, uh, First Thessalonians, I think. Or just finished second. First time in his life reading through his Bible. But he's reading slowly and carefully, and we're pounding him with doctrine. <laughs> and the poor guy, I mean, but he's just eating it up. And to be around somebody like that, like a sponge. And every time I see him, he says, I have a question. And he's hit me with these theological questions. I just love that. I could talk Bible all day, and you guys know that. And, uh, you know, I love preaching. There's nothing like getting up and just, just preaching the gospel of God. And even, you know, a, a bunch of believers are already on your way to heaven. But to stand up and talk about redemption and Jesus' blood and his payment for us, and I'm saved, I know I'm saved, I'm always saved. And, and it's just, just to fire up, I love the things of God. I think heaven's going to be like, it's like taking the things I love now and, and exploding them beyond imagination. That's why I think about these people who, who love their rock and roll and they're drinking and they're swearing and their groups and their crowds and their bars. I'm like, man, you don't want to go to heaven. You can't even handle church. You don't want to go to heaven. If, if, if I turned on God's music, you'd turn it off. Why would you want to go to heaven and listen to all those saints sing? You don't want to go to heaven. But for us, 
You ever been to a church uh, where there's five or 6,000 people and they shut off the instruments and they all start to sing? Yes, sir. And with just a taste of heaven. You know, what it will be like when the saints sing and to sit among believers. And, uh, you know, and, and the guy down at the bar who thinks this tractor sexy, he's, you know, he, he's, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to be there. You know, he doesn't want to be among those saints. He, he doesn't want to be that place. And I say, heaven's not for you, you know. And that's when God comes into somebody like that and transforms that free will creature. That was me once, you know. I like 80s rock, right? That was me. Right? And now I listen to it and I see the deception and the filth. I didn't realize all those long hair bands, those guys were gay. They were? And I look at it now and I'm like, how did I not see they were gay? How did I not see that? They're wearing all their mom's clothes. I mean, it's so obvious, you know? And I'm like, I did not. Now it's coming out. They all were gay. And I'm like, I thought they were kind of cool guys. And I'm like, you, and the music was so horrible and deceptive and, and wicked. And I listen to it now, and I'm just like, man, it's, it's so filthy. It's so dirty. You come away feeling dirty. You know, just sometimes I experiment, do these mental experiments on the power of music. And, and I go back and I listen to that and listen to this and I listen to different genre and, and discover the power behind the music because Brother Cloud taught me that there's spirit behind music and that, that it's pure spirit. And that's the danger of music. It bypasses the intellect and goes directly to the spirit of a man. And that's why you can tell somebody's music by their attitude. Uh, and, and as you're looking at it, and, and, and that's why country music makes you lascivious, uh, rap music makes you angry, uh, rock music makes you rebellious. And all these musics have a spirit behind them. Country music makes you very very lascivious and sexually perverted and each one of these genres has has a spirit behind it and that's why you can't mix christianity with rock and roll because it's rebellion and christ and they don't go together country and rock and roll and christ don't go together because one's lewd and one's holy they can never go together so as i look at the genre of the music and i see the power and spirit behind them sometimes i i have to go into that rock or i have to go into the the rap and man i tell you what you listen to it a little bit and you're like okay i'm starting to see the the power of the spirit behind it and what do you find you come away dirty hating the filth of the spot of the garment and you can feel what it does to your spirit. So then you turn on a, a good Christian song, you know, not the Christian radio, that's garbage. You turn on a good Christian song, right? And what comes into your heart? What comes into your spirit, right? And God says that it must be with reverence and godly fear and filling your heart with grace. And then I know it's God's. Yeah? And it's just so powerful. And I feel the spirit behind that music, you know? And man, it's just, uh, I love that. How did God get me here? And could he do it for that jerk over there in the bar? Because I was that jerk in the bar once. Yeah, he can. He can take a free will creature and transform him by his power. And he'll use you to do it. And if you can, you're saved. Because that's divine power. It's not swinging from the chandeliers. It's not jibber jabbering. It's not raising your hands in church. It's not, and all that stuff may be great or whatever you want to do. I don't care how high you jump on Sunday. It's how you walk on Monday. But if you can't be used by God in the transformation of a soul, yeah, you're going to struggle. Will God use you in divine power, which is the power to transform a soul? Yeah, it's not the power to make a car run. I wish I could lay hands on a car. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, but that's called witchcraft. And God doesn't work there. It's not flying on a broom, <laughs> right? <laughs> Praise God, right? I say that often to ladies when I see the broom. I say, here, here, but don't fly home. And uh, <laughs> that's a good way to get hit, by the way. Are you sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise? Well, it's a blessing to you. I hope you can say, I am sealed with that Holy Ghost. I know it. I know it. How do you know you're saved? Well, I prayed. Oh, please don't say that. Well, I got baptized. If you say that, I'm slapping you. <laughs> you're, you're a fundamentalist. You know better. And uh, Are you saved? Prove it. I have the Holy Spirit. It's the only answer that we have in this life right now. Right? I have the Holy Spirit. His spirit bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. Hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit that he gave us. And you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Is it the power to live perfect? No. I haven't met one yet. Is, is it the power to forsake all sin? I haven't. Have you? 
What is it the power to put out a tie on Sunday? Even one with pumpkins? They're basketball. Yeah, but from the camera, it looks like pumpkins. And uh, <laughs> my basketball tie, first time I wore it. What do you think? Amen. Stupid. Yeah, I know. Um, is that the power to dress up on Sunday? No. What, what is the power to quit swearing? How are you doing? I hope you're doing pretty good. My wife's doing all right. Yeah. It's been, what, 24 hours? I mean, she doesn't swear on Sundays. And uh, we're going to go home, and uh, you're going to thank God tonight for the Spirit of God that dwells within you. Amen. Or you're going to wonder if the Spirit of God's in you. Either one's good, because God said, examine yourself, right? And God said to thank Him, you know? And you can, did anybody ever ask God if I'm saved? Oh, come on. You've asked God that. I've asked God that. It was only, what, a year and a half ago. Man, I was really just struggling. Am I even saved? I mean, we go through that in our lives, right? And what do you search for? How do I know? Uh, tell me, God, am I saved? <laughs> I mean, is that how it works? You know, I listen to a Christian radio and say, am I saved? No, what happens? You examine yourself. Does the Holy Spirit dwell within? It's the only evidence that exists in this world. Yes, sir. You say that this is not something Yes. I've never met an unsaved person who doubts their salvation. <laughs> I've only met saved people who doubt their salvation. Now, maybe there's some unsaved people out there who doubt their salvation, and they should because they're not saved, obviously. If you're not saved, doubt your salvation. But every person I've ever met that doubted their salvation, I was pretty convinced that they were saved. Why? Because if you're concerned about whether or not you're going to go to heaven, <laughs> That doesn't come from the world, okay? That, that, that comes from the Spirit of God, and, uh, and you've grieved him somehow, and something's happening on the inside. Now, I'm sure there's some people out there that doubt their salvation to come up and get saved, right? And uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that are saved that get resaved, which is impossible, but they call it their day of salvation. And uh, I've heard of one recently that I, that I suspect was somebody who got saved, but they just were in the point of... of grievance and wonder and struggling and they're going to count that as their day of salvation now does it matter when were you saved i don't know does it matter how come god never asked you what day you were saved does god ever ask you what day you're saved does anywhere in this bible say what day are you saved what does it say are you saved My present tense you ready to go home let's go home i'm almost out of water father in heaven thank you lord for it for your kindness and I want to say, Lord, thank you for the Holy Spirit that dwells within, that has made Dan Mills something different than I ever thought I'd be. But you transformed me by your power. I thank you for it, Lord. I pray for the transforming power of Jesus Christ in the lives of these folks, that we all of us might be assured of our salvation. If there's somebody not saved, of course, God, we want them to wonder and to search out and find Christ and, and uh, Lord, be, be sealed in the day that they have believed. But those that are saved, Lord, is it an insult to you for us to come to you? No, God, it's an obedience to say, examine yourself. Because it's the most important thing I know that I own is my soul. So, God, I pray uh, for that, that, that searching soul, whether they're watching online, could be two years from now on YouTube, God, I don't know. But they're searching. I pray for that precious soul who's searching. That the person, Lord, who doesn't have their assurance of their salvation may receive it and know with all confidence it's eternal. Thank you, God, for your, for your goodness to us. Help us not to deceive and help us not to lead people into a false salvation. God, give our church wisdom and strength to know what to do and how to do it. Thank you, Lord, for your kindness. The week starts, God. We, we come out of this place. We walk into the world tomorrow. And we got plans and things and endeavors and what we're going to do. We don't know what the future holds. We don't know what the, the next Sunday might bring. But, Father, between now and the next time we meet, we know there's a God of heaven who will guide each one of us. Whether it's here or there or in the air, wherever it is, Lord, I pray now we might be found about your business. I do ask this week, Lord, uh, one more petition of thee that you might lead me to a soul. I know I need to try harder. I know I need to reach out more. I know I need to endeavor to, 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 to try to win somebody to Christ, to find a sinner. Lord, I know. I know I'm not what I ought to be, but God, I do ask you many times in my life and to divine providence, you've led me to somebody who's ready to be saved. And God, if there's somebody hurting, if somebody close by, God, 
send them near us. Perhaps there's another person in this church more worthy than I, more prepared than I, more ready to share the gospel than I. And God, I would certainly concede that you send that poor soul next to him or her. But God, may our church be a soul-winning place, a hospital for the hurting. I ask you for that, Lord. Bless us as we endeavor to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night. Escape. Run before I start.